Once upon a time, I used to be like you, half a century ago, when I was at medical school. I didn't really learn much about nutrition in uh, all the 10 years I was at university because I, I, I loved university, I did different degrees there. We only had two hours of nutrition in the whole course. Um, but I was very lucky, uh, a lucky accident happened to me. I fell in love with a veterinary student and I started going to her classes as well. And there, they were teaching their students all about nutrition, how important nutrition was in maintaining the health of their farm animals. And I went back to my medical professors and said, well, clearly, nutrition has got to be important for humans too. We are animals as well. Uh, and my professors said, please don't waste our time. This is not what medicine is all about. So, uh, I kept on asking questions and kept on causing trouble. I, I graduated from Edinburgh University. Um, I graduated at the top of my class, summa cum laude, and I was offered a professorship. Actually, uh, it wouldn't, I would have been a very young professor, but I had already fallen out of love with medicine. It was clear to me that it was going in what I considered to be very unproductive directions. And those directions were defined not so much by any conscious or deliberate policy or philosophy. They were rooted in the philosophy and in the healthcare problems of the past. Medicine as we currently teach it is, it's wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. Now I know that you're all going to be doctors and I'm going to try to place as much doubt in your minds as I can. Because the medicine that you're taught, the medicine that we practice is, by and large, it is crisis management medicine. It is post hoc medicine. And it is medicine that is based on a Pasteurian philosophy. And that is fundamentally a Socratic philosophy. And it is an entirely appropriate medical approach if you're dealing with the healthcare problems of the 19th century, which is where the philosophical roots of the medical model of today come from. The concept that you can find a sufficient difference between a microbe and a man to develop a magic bullet that will kill the microbe and hopefully not the man. And that is still at the core of modern medicine. And yet the diseases that are important today are by and large no longer the infectious diseases, they're chronic degenerative diseases. And in the most part they are not caused by pathogens. There are exceptions to that as you know but they are caused by multiple metabolic errors which are due in turn to multiple nutritional issues and other lifestyle factors. And the idea that you can shoot diabetes with a magic bullet without harming the patient or cancer or heart disease or osteoporosis is absurd. And yet we continue down this philosophical dead end because of the vested interests of the pharmaceutical industry which largely influences the medical curriculum and the healthcare insurance industry and all of the rest of the money because that is where the healthcare business is most successful. Let me ask you a rhetorical question. How successful do you think the healthcare business actually is? In f <laughs> it, depends, it depends on your metric. If you're measuring it in terms of money, it's highly successful. It's highly successful. It's healthcare accounts for approximately 10% of the GDP of most European member states. In America, it's 19.7%, which shows you how inefficient their medical system is. And if you compare it to other economic sectors in terms of global economic productivity, healthcare is in the top five, along with defense, food, alcohol, and recreational drugs, which is a sad comment on our times. But let's take another metric. How effective is the healthcare system at killing people? We're in the top three, along with defense and food. But if we take a metric that I hope you'll be more comfortable with, how good is the healthcare business at maintaining public health? It has been a complete and total disaster. I think in Hungary you know that because your particular healthcare profiles are amongst the worst of the world. You are at the very top of the international league tables for both cancer and heart disease. Your healthcare system has failed. It has failed you, it has failed your nation. But I'm not 
here to make an anti-Hungarian statement. This is a very general truth. In fact, you have much here to be proud of. Some of my medical heroes are Hungarians. But let's measure the healthcare business in terms of what has actually happened to our public health since 1950. And since 1950, almost everything has got worse. So, for example, I won't go through all of these in detail because it would take too long, but you all know that as a country, as a culture in the West and increasingly throughout the world, we are becoming heavier and we are seeing more people who are overweight, obese, and along with that comes insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, and type 2 diabetes is effectively an acceleration of the aging process. It confers considerable glycative and therefore inflammatory stress and increases the risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular complications, a range of gastrointestinal tract cancers, Alzheimer's, which we increasingly think of as type 3 or type 4 diabetes, end-stage renal disease, non-alcohol related fatty liver disease, blindness, ophthalmological problems, peripheral neuropathy, you know it. Which is why the diabetic, no matter how well we try to manage them, still has a lost life expectancy of between six and eight years. Along with that, the burden of related healthcare conditions is also increasing. So you see here, non-alcohol related fatty liver disease, end-stage renal disease, these are increasing to such an extent that we no longer have enough tissues to transplant, surgeons to transplant them, or specialist physicians to take care of these problems. Hypertension goes along with metabolic disorder, but there are other factors involved, such as the severe electrolyte imbalance present in the Western diet, now affects more than half of all Americans. We are not far behind. The dementias, they've increased 250% since 1950, and it's not because we are, as a population, getting older. I'll show you some data in a minute that proves that. In the age group over 65, neurodegenerative deaths from Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, motor neuron disease, and the rest of those types of conditions have increased in the last 25 years alone, threefold in men and fivefold in women. That's at the end of life. Clearly our central nervous systems are under attack because of our lifestyle. But at the beginning of our lives, you know as well as I do that the problems of neurodevelopmental disorders, all the way through from autism to dysphasia, dyspraxia, ADD, ADHD, all of these are increasing quite dramatically as well. So something about our environment, our lifestyle, our diet is affecting our brains at the beginning of life and it's clearly affecting them at the end. What is it doing to you? You are not unaffected. Your brains are being damaged too. And I will show you some data in a minute to show you how much more stupid you are than my generation was. <laughs> no, no. This is true. You should worry about this. The non-tobacco related cancers have increased by approximately 100%. When I was at medical school, I was told, I was taught that the lifetime risk of breast cancer in women was 1 in 33. Now it's 1 in 11. This is not simply diagnostic artifact. These are real increases. And it's not because as a population we're aging, because we see the same or similar increases in the incidence of cancer in the young. We've seen 100% increases in cancer in teens and young adults. And one cancer in particular, bowel cancer, has quadrupled in the 22 to 37 year old group. That's a red flag. That is telling you something about the terrible diet that your generation is now eating. But it is indicative of increased cancer risk in many other tissues as well. Let's move quickly to the connective tissue system, osteoporosis. This is the work of Chris Obrand who has been studying the Danish and Swedish databases and what he's found is that low impact fractures are far more common than they used to be. Our skeletal integrity is not what it was. Our peak bone mineral density is reduced compared to even two generations ago and it is significantly less than it was 200 years ago. And we know this because in London we have dug up the skeletons of people who died in the plague. We know how old they were we know that they had sedentary occupations in many cases, and yet they had better skeletal integrity than people do today, even those who go to the gym and are athletic. So our skeletal tissues are under attack. 
as is our cartilage. Look at the figures for the increase in hip and knee replacement. That's partly because of our increased physical weight. But there are other nutritional, biochemical and metabolic factors at play here too. Asthma, you know as well as I do how significant that has become. When I was at medical school, no, going before that, going back to the 50s, I went to a school with 2,000 children in it. In that school, there was one boy who had asthma. Can you imagine? This poor child, when he had an asthma attack, we'd never seen anything like it before. We would stand around in a circle and watch him. Now you go to a class in any typical school and you find that one in four children is relying on an inhaler. You think that's normal? It's not. It's completely abnormal. In fact, the immune system, our immune systems, have become extremely dysfunctional. It's not just in terms of allergies. It's not just allergic conjunctivitis, dermatitis, rhinitis, those you know, but also the eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, which you can think of as allergies involving the gut. And then the increase in autoimmune diseases, which infects everything from Graves to Hashimoto's to SLE, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, all of those are increasing by between 3 and 4% a year. This is a picture of a generation, a population, that is suffering from chronic intoxication. Look, I, because we're such a small audience today, <laughs> I, I usually speak to much, much bigger audiences, we can have a conversation. I don't have to be didactic, we can be dialectic. So if I make a point that you disagree with, if I raise an issue that you think is incorrect or misleading, challenge me. We can make this into a conversation, okay, if you want. <clears throat> I said I'd talk to you a little bit more about what's happening to our brains and central nervous systems. Neurological deaths have risen quite dramatically in the over 65 year old age group, but it's more than that. What we're seeing that these diseases are appearing in younger and younger age groups. So ever since 1995, and that's not very long ago, that's only 20 years ago, the average age of onset of neurodegenerative disease has fallen by 10 years. Same thing is true of diabetes. If I go back to the previous slide, when I was at medical school, type two diabetes was a disease of old age. Now you see it in people in their 40s, 30s, in their teens, in their preteens. Many of these diseases have not only increased in frequency, they have decreased in latency. We see them occurring in younger and younger groups of subjects. We now regularly diagnose early onset neurodegenerative disease in subjects in their 40s. That was unprecedented. We would never have expected to see cases like this 50 years ago. And that younger people are being affected as well. Something is attacking your brains and it's attacking your brains directly. This is a meta-analysis, a study of studies carried out by scientists at the universities of Hartford, Ulster and Brussels. And what they did, they looked at measurements of IQ over time. In fact, the tests go back to 1894 when the first of these mechanical IQ tests was done. Now, there are different ways of measuring IQ, but one very simple and very direct way is to show subjects a choice of symbols on a screen they then have to decide what that means and depending on what they see they then press a button or pull a lever it's information in recognition collation decision making motor action information and it's a it's a way of a crude way of measuring how effective the central nervous system is operating and it correlates surprisingly well with iq measured in most other ways and what these studies show they just threw out all the outliers, they just kept the best studies, the most robust designs. What they show is that since 1950, we have become significantly slower. These are not the very young or the very old, these are young to middle-aged people in their neurological prime, just like you. And the extent to which you have slowed since 1950 is the equivalent of a reduction of 15 IQ points. 15! That is a lot. When you consider that when the IQ designs were first put together, the mean and the mode was set at 100, it's now 85. That's not very far above educationally subnormal. We as a population, as a species, are becoming significantly more stupid. Now, I know you think you know far more than your parents. I used to think the same thing. But maybe that's not true. 
Maybe that's not true at all. In fact, the evidence says that it isn't. And do you know what alarms me about this graph? Where is it going? It's still going downhill. Does it matter? Well, maybe it doesn't because actually we are faced with a more profound question, an existential question. Is our species going to survive at all? And I'm not talking about the political stupidity of Donald Trump or political issues at all. I'm just talking about nutritional factors and health. Now you know perfectly well that there is a serious endemic problem with infertility amongst women. But the male reproductive apparatus is also under attack. Not only do we see increased prostate and testicular cancer, we see falling testosterone levels. This is the work of Andre Gieselfoss, who is at the University of Oslo. He looked at testosterone levels in serum samples that had been stored over the years there. They have a data bank of serum samples which goes back for 50 or 60 years. And what he found is that contemporary testosterone levels in males have fallen by about 30%. In other words, men are less male than they used to be. And as a result, their sperm counts are falling. In fact, since 1970, male sperm counts in the West, at any rate, have fallen by almost two thirds. And the result of that is that we are now seeing increasing numbers of subfertile and infertile men. And if this current trend continues, and it shows no sign of slowing down, we will reach a point in the next 20 to 25 years where we will see population collapse, not planned collapse, not gradual collapse, but population implosions with all of the chaos and destruction that that will bring with it. And the reason why I do think things will get worse are studies like this. This is Hulsager's work, Wim Hulsager, who's an excellent Dutch scientist. And what he's been doing is looking at physical fitness and comparing it from generation to generation. And this is a beautiful paper uh, written in the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology in 2013. You can read it as well as I can. He said, junk diets and sedentary lifestyle have created a situation where today's adults are so unhealthy that they are in every sense 15 years older than their parents and grandparents were at the same age. And that, together with the impact of the epidemic of type 2 diabetes, the increase in neurodegenerative deaths and all those other problems means that life expectancy must fall. In fact, there is evidence that it is already falling. And there are very obvious clues that this is due to disnutrition. If you look at the situation in the UK, and it's not so very different here, one in three children are now overweight and obese, but one in 12 children unexpectedly are underweight. These are both indicators of disnutrition. And on current trends, this is based on a distillation of people who are experts in their own individual areas. They say of another 76 million obese adults with an additional 6 to 8.5 million cases of diabetes, you can see the rest of it. You can read the rest of it for yourselves. And if you're interested, I'll leave a copy of this presentation here. All the references are there. You can go back to the original scientific literature and check it for yourself. By 2050, on current trends, the incidence of diabetes will double. Well, that was published in 2010. The incidence has already doubled because the Chinese data has come online. The incidence of Alzheimer's disease will triple. We're going to beat that too. The incidence of cancer will triple. We are way ahead on that projection. We're out of balance, fundamentally out of balance. And I don't really like picking on just a single nutritional ingredient because in nutrition, things do not work in a linear way. Many nutrients overlap in terms of their function. Many physiological functions can be modulated by more than one nutrient. This is very nonlinear. This is a stochastic science. It is not like pharmaceutical pharmacology. Natural pharmacology is not only more diverse and more potent in many ways, it is much more complicated. One reason why medical schools do not teach very much of it. But I will single out 
two compounds because they are very much at the heart of this, omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. We are very out of balance when it comes to our intake of these compounds and that has enormous leverage, enormous influence on our public and private health prospects. So why are these fatty acids important? Well, firstly, they have structural significance. The percentage of the different fatty acids that you build into your cell membranes has an impact on cell membrane fluidity and permeability, and it has some impact on the way in which cells communicate with each other. But these fatty acids are also the precursor to families of what I shall call hormones. You know, the prostaglandins, the eicosanoids, and all the rest of those things. Where does it all start? Well, cell membrane, phospholipid bilayer, they're phosphatidyl phospholipids, and there are your fatty acids, the tails on the glycerol colors of the phosphatidyl phospholipids. And if an inflammatory stimulus comes along, which could be a disease-associated molecular pattern, it could be excessive radical oxygen species, it could be an age-rage interaction. The sequence starts with the activation of phospholipase A2, leading to degradation of those fatty acids. And depending on the proportion of those fatty acids in your cell membrane, that determines the proportions of the different types of local hormones that are produced. And if you have too many omega-6s and not enough omega-3s, the breakdown products from these are predominantly pro-inflammatory. And when that happens, these compounds attack the extracellular matrix. I'll come back to that in a minute because that's really important because this is where chronic inflammation or nutrition meets chronic inflammation, meets tissue destruction, meets chronic degenerative disease. The sequence is now quite well understood and I will try and explain that to you today. But here's your basic biochemistry. Your omega-6s which are fundamentally derived from terrestrial plants, form mediators which are broadly speaking pro-inflammatory. That's a generalization, not all of them are. And the omega-3s, which are the only important ones, the only significant ones come from seafoods, form compounds which are fundamentally anti-inflammatory. And that's implicit in the, the names that we give them, resolvins, neuroprotectins, and maresins, which comes from mare, the Latin for the ocean. And the point is, that when you make these breakdown compounds, they are all metabolized via the same enzymes, COX-2 and your lipoxygenases. And these enzymes have limited capacity. And so if your diet is full of omega-6s, and your body fat is full of omega-6s, and your cell membranes are full of omega-6s, once phospholipase A2 becomes active, the phospholipids that are based on omega-6s, they flood your metabolic machinery and they crowd out the omega-3s and so you end up creating a climate or an environment to quote Claude Bernard the father of physiology in your body which is fundamentally pro-inflammatory after 1900 you can see they start to diverge why is that because omega-3s become more expensive you probably don't know this but in the 19th century wild salmon and oysters were the foods of the poor we know this because laboring contracts in Britain would say that we will work for you, Lord Debrecen or whoever the labor aristocrat was, for one guinea a week, providing you do not feed us wild salmon more than three times a week. People were sick of it. There was so much of it. Wild salmon isn't so cheap anymore. Oysters used to be so cheap they were given away for free in the coffee houses and the ale houses where today we give away peanuts and bar snacks, they used to give away oysters for free. Not anymore. They've become quite expensive. So for these reasons, omega-3 intake has become much less significant. Omega-6s, on the other hand, take off because at around 1900, the food industry develops techniques for the first time which clean and stabilize plant oil. So now they have a long shelf life now they can be incorporated into a range of different foods and the food industry accepts them by the hundreds of millions of gallons and pours them into processed foods to improve texture and palatability. And so 
our omega-6 to 3 ratio starts to increase. And when you come closer up to date and the datum becomes more robust again, you can see that since 1960, in the last half century, the ratios of 6s to 3s in the body fat of Americans and the body fat is another way of looking at 6 to 3 intakes. It's almost as accurate as looking at cell membrane ratios. It has increased approximately threefold. Why is that? Because of the McDonald's Happy Meal, which is not very happy at all. I'm curious to know, how many of you eat at McDonald's? One, two, three, and the rest of you are, and the rest of you are liars. <laughs> but it's not just McDonald's. It's also Burger King and Pizza Hut and all the rest of them. And it's also most processed food today. Why? Because of the way in which our agricultural system has been transformed. Global, ag global agricultural product is now monopolized by a very small number of companies. And the diversity at the base has been dramatically whittled down to the point where really a large part of the global food chain rests on two columns, soy and corn. Yeah, wheat and potatoes, but soy and corn are at the core. You drive across North America, large parts of South America, you drive through a green ocean, hundreds of miles of nothing but soy and corn. And what happens to that soy and corn? Well, firstly, it is full of linoleic acid, which is a short chain omega-6. And a lot of that soy and corn is turned into animal feed. And that animal feed is fed to pigs and cows and chickens that are imprisoned in the CAFOD system, intensive agricultural production. Those animals are not designed to eat soy and corn. That soy and corn makes them very sick. It makes them diabetic. Did you know that by the time most cows go to slaughter, they already have diabetes? They have chronic infections, which means that they need constant antibiotic treatment. Many of them have cancers, but they end up in the food chain anyway. But because they're eating so much omega-6, the meat, the milk, the eggs, the cheese is also full of omega-6. And that ends up inside us. And then we make matters worse by cooking with supposedly heart-healthy soy and corn oil. We add more omega-6. which is why ratios of 6 to 3 in Europe are now an average of 15 to 1 and in the United States they're 25 to 1. And if you want to know where these data come from, they come from Vitas Laboratories, who I work with. We have a database of over a quarter million samples of cell membrane lipid analysis. It is the largest library of its kind in the world. That makes us the experts. When other academics want to look at this issue, they come and talk to us, they use our data. We have the biggest of big data in this area. Now, if too many omega-6s predisposes you to chronic inflammation, and if America has the highest ratios in the known world, and they, it's not quite the highest, but for purposes of our argument, I'll say that it is, then we would expect them to have severe health care problems. And they do. Americans are extremely sick. 70% of Americans rely on a one prescription medication and 20% of Americans can only survive by taking five prescription pharmaceutical products every day. Let me put that into context for you. Americans constitute 5% of the global population and they are consuming more than half of all the pharmaceutical product in the world. That's how sick they are. They are consuming 80% of all prescription painkillers. One in five of Americans is now taking an antidepressant. They are a sick, sick people. So you might ask yourself, is this because in America, if you've been there, Pharmaceutical companies can advertise directly on television to the consumer. Yeah, maybe it's a part of it. 
Is it because Americans are more neurotic than Hungarians? No, you're just as neurotic as they are. Or are the Americans really sicker? From these figures, you have to conclude that the Americans really are. It must be very painful and very depressing to be an American subject. But it's logical. If you have a 25 to 1, 6 to 3 ratio, you have a lot of chronic inflammation. If you have chronic inflammation, you have degenerative disease, you need pharmaceutical products, you have pain, you need painkillers. If you have chronic inflammation in your hypothalamus, you have depression and you need antidepressants. Do they still teach you the monoamine hypothesis of depression? Is that still in your curriculum? Help me. Do you? <laughs> You're not sure? Are you medical students? Do they teach you in medical school in Debertson that the problem with depression is because your serotonin is too low? No, that's not right. I was one of the people who came up with that hypothesis 40 years ago. I was just on the edges of the group that did the work. But we were wrong. We were completely wrong. It has nothing to do with serotonin. The current model of depression is all about chronic inflammatory stress and glucocorticoid receptor abnormalities in the hypothalamus leading to a loss of neuronal plasticity. So if you have a high 6 to 3 ratio and you have chronic inflammation, you get depression. And I'll show you some more data to support that later on. But I want to point out to you that the current model of medicine is completely wrong because the way you spend your money has nothing, the amount of money you spend has nothing to do with outcomes. I mean, if you think American medicine is the right way to go, you're completely wrong. They outspend you at least two to one. But if you look at the outcomes, and the average life expectancy is a kind of rough and ready indicator of how healthy the population is, they're spending way more than anybody else, but they're 28th in the international league table. So compare that, for example, with Japan, where life expectancy is five years longer on average, and they're spending half as much. Or pretend it as Japan, or look, for example, at Cuba, who are spending less than 10%, but getting the same output. Now, the American medical model is an extreme version. It's a kind of a distortion of the medicine that you practice here. It's even more extreme than the pharmaceutically based model that you practice here, but it does not make the population more healthy. That is not the way to spend your money. Pharmaceutical pharmacology may treat symptoms, but despite a century of research and countless millions of dollars and forints and yen that we've spent on pharmaceuticals, what we have is a portfolio of very expensive, very specific, very toxic drugs, and yet we still have no cures for coronary artery disease or cancer or osteoporosis. Doesn't that tell you that we were aiming our guns in the wrong direction? And life expectancy is falling. Despite all the medical money that we throw at public health, all the symptomatic treatments, that we throw at our patients. And in the process, we kill many of our patients. Iatrogenic illness is now acknowledged to be the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. So this is data from the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. And in 2015, for the first time, they showed a significant reduction in life expectancy in both men and women. I shouldn't say the first time. It's happened twice before this century, once during the great Spanish flu pandemic in 1918-19, and then again, it happened at the height of the HIV AIDS pandemic. But there's nothing like that going on at the moment. Yes, I know that there is an increase in neo-opioid overdoses, but that's not enough to explain this fallback in life expectancy. And the CDC statement is quite clear in this respect. They say the death rates rose for eight of the top 10 causes of death. We're getting sicker. We've reached peak life expectancy. We've reached peak intelligence. Everything is going downhill from here, folks. Enjoy the ride. Modern medicine is not the answer. But perhaps we can begin to look at this from a different perspective. 
I'm sure your teachers have been telling you that how important chronic inflammation is. They've been teaching you that chronic inflammation is a driver for most and perhaps all of the major chronic degenerative diseases. Why don't we see this? Why haven't we done something about it? This is what an archipelago looked like to the 18th century sailor. Separate land masses with water in between. But then the development of oceanography in the following century showed for the first time that those islands were connected. That they were simply the tips of a mountain range that lay below the ocean. And this is the 20th century view of medicine. There you have cancer, heart disease, dementia, osteoporosis. They look separate. But you are taught those diseases as separate entities. But now we know that they're all fundamentally deeply related, with the exception of a small number of cases where genetic factors are predominant in the mass population. They are simply the surface manifestations, the symptomatic manifestations of a deep underlying problem. And the name of that problem, that underwater mountain range, is chronic inflammation. And now I'm going to talk to you about how chronic inflammation causes those diseases. But you need to break free of your thinking. Forget about the different medical disciplines, because it really doesn't matter to me whether you're a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, a dermatologist, a nephrologist, you're all mostly, most of the time, treating the same condition. The elephant in the room is chronic inflammation. And that is what the machinery of chronic inflammation looks like. And it is so complicated that I don't really understand all of it. I mean, I recognize parts of it. There you've got your age-rage interaction, your damage-associated molecular patterns, reactive oxygen species, oxidized cholesterol. A lot of this is known. But what I want to focus on is a simplified version of this. I'm going to talk about the inflammasome, which is really at the core of this complex process, because it is activated no matter what the inflammation is caused by. And there's a very simple way to show this. You have to think of the inflammasome as a series of organisms, organelles, enzymes. They're fundamentally in two different chambers. There's an upper chamber and a lower chamber. And in the upper chamber, this is where the omega-6s and omega-3s play a role. If you have an excessive 6 to 3 ratio, as almost all of you do, this produces lipid mediators which are fundamentally pro-inflammatory. Now, at this point, you have not yet caused tissue damage. This is not yet causing disease. But what it does do, it causes local edema, swelling, erythema. It causes the accumulation of certain types of immune cell but it also leads to the opening of the second chamber. And that is when these cells, the cells that are affected, they exude lysosomes. Those lysosomes are left behind as vesicles. Those vesicles rupture. They release matrix metalloproteases and proteases in a very destructive cascade sequence, which damage the extracellular matrix. And it is by damaging the extracellular matrix that you start to create degenerative disease. And here, it is not the omega-6s or 3s that are important. It is a group of compounds known as the polyphenols. And that is one reason why I'm so happy to be in Debrecen in Hungary, because the godfather of polyphenol chemistry is the very great Hungarian biochemist Albert St. George one of my personal scientific and political heroes. And he referred to it as vitamin P because I think it was derived from paprika, because it treated permeability, and because there were vitamins for many other letters, P had not yet been taken, so. And he was responsible for the development of a series of products based around polyphenols, which were actually very effective anti-inflammatories and analgesics, but the pharmaceutical industry destroyed all that, they discredited that work and it was forgotten. There were also problems to do with the fact that there wasn't just one polyphenol, there were tens of thousands of them and it was difficult to standardize. So those enzymes, the matrix metalloproteases and the proteases, eventually lead to the destruction of the matrix, the extracellular matrix, which is 
what this looks like. This is actually a photograph, a microphotograph of ECM. And you can see here, these are spaces where your cells are. So this is a three-dimensional mesh of microfibers that holds all of your cells in place, correctly orientated so that they can communicate with one another, coordinate with one another, and function as a tissue, or as an organ, or as a physiological system. If you destroy that matrix, your cells float away. They can't talk to each other anymore. They can't function. Your tissues degrade. Are you familiar with the matrix metalloproteases? Do you know, for example, that they are typically overexpression of MMPs are associated with more aggressive cancers? Because the cancer that produces more MMPs is able to destroy more matrix, which encourages and allows angiogenesis and metastatic spread. You know all about this, yes? Okay, well, most people who are not medical students are not familiar with the matrix metalloproteases, and they don't know how destructive they are. But these are the same enzymes that are produced by the so-called flesh-eating bacteria. And if you are unlucky enough to be attacked by a flesh-eating bacterium, these enzymes turn you into goulash. You dissolve. They dissolve everything. They dissolve skin, fascia, ligaments, muscle, bone. They dissolve everything. You see, it is that matrix that holds you together. When this matrix is damaged, either by inflammation or as part of the aging process, you fray like a cheap fabric. That is what a large part of aging actually is. Now that is a grotesque example of what happens when large amounts of these matrix destructive enzymes are released in a short period of time. It is the same enzymes that are released in smaller amounts over decades that contribute to progressive tissue damage. The same as that picture, but it happens more slowly. Now, these degenerative diseases have long preclinical or latent phases. Most of you probably already have coronary artery disease. We know this because when we look at road traffic accidents, even of children in their teens, we see already fatty streaks in the linings of their arteries, which grow over time and say 30, 40 or 50 years later, come to the surface as angina or as a heart attack. You can lose enough bone over 30 or 40 years before you finally experience a POTS or a Coles fracture or a vertebral wedge fracture or a femoral neck fracture. These are slow processes. Very slow. You already have degenerative disease. There is no such thing as a healthy population anymore. You already have chronic inflammation because of your diet, which means that as you sit here listening to me, your arteries are inflamed and atheroma is growing. Your bones are slowly crumbling as the osteoid that holds the mineral components of bone in place slowly dissolves. The brain cells inside your skulls are dying one by one. Are you glad you came to this lecture? Which might seem very negative, but I regard that as very positive because the evolutionary process has ensured that we have a vast overcapacity of most tissues. You actually have time to do something about it now before these conditions become so serious that they become symptomatic and you then require medical treatment. And this is my fundamental criticism of the way medicine is practiced today. Doctors never arrive in time. They only arrive when the symptoms have become obvious. And that is halfway through or two thirds of the way through the disease or more. It's like a fire service that only ever comes to your burning house when it has already burnt halfway to the ground. And what do the doctors do when they arrive at the scene of the house fire? They have symptomatic treatments only, nothing that can interfere with the underlying process. Your entire medical model is wrong. And the problem is that we find it very difficult to measure. It's almost impossible to measure. You use CRP, the smart people use HSCRP, and you know what? They're no good. They're not sensitive enough. Because this inflammation is so slow, so gradual, we have no adequate biomarkers. And I don't think we ever will. 
So what can we go by? Well, we can look at certain symptoms of chronic inflammation. If you have chronic inflammation in the vascular system, that will manifest itself as raised diastolic blood pressure. It will also manifest itself as hemorrhoids or varicose veins. Accelerated skin aging is another giveaway. And if you have depression or an allergy or a medical condition ending in itis, then you already know that you have chronic inflammation and you should do something about it. Now you wouldn't have to if you had enough sixes and threes and you had enough polyphenols, but the six to three ratio has gone and guess what? Our polyphenol intakes have gone as well. The government tells you to eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. Why? I can't tell you. That was an arbitrary political figure. It has no basis in scientific fact. The people who know about this are the Department of Human Nutrition at Tufts University in Boston. And they have shown quite clearly that you need to eat 10 portions of fruit and vegetables a day to give you enough of the phytonutrients and specifically the polyphenols to have an impact on your health prospects. But most of you don't even eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. I want you to show me how many of you eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. Put your hand up if you do. One. Nobody else. Don't they teach you anything at Debertson Medical School? Okay, look at what happens in the blue zones. In the blue zones, people don't age in the way that we do. They don't have chronic inflammation. They have relatively little degenerative disease. In the mid-Victorian era, which is the largest of the blue zones, it's an island not in space but in time, people ate 10 portions of fruits and vegetables a day. Why? Because they were so physically active. Not only did they eat three times more fruits and vegetables than we do, the fruits and vegetables they ate were very different. They were all organic, obviously. But look at the Oreloom varieties. When you even measure them, what we find is that they contain much higher levels of polyphenols in most cases than these fruits and vegetables do today. So we are eating only a third of the polyphenols our great-great-grandparents used to do. The fruits and vegetables we're eating contain only a third of the polyphenols that the heirloom varieties used to do. Simple maths. Our intake of polyphenols has fallen by at least 90%. Do you even know what heirloom fruits and vegetables look like? This is what carrots and tomatoes used to look like. These are the old species. I don't think you find these in the supermarkets anymore. These are potatoes. They're full of color. Those colors are phytonutrients. They're polyphenols and carotenoids. They're signaling compounds. They're phytoalexins. From the plant's perspective, they are defense compounds, and from our perspective, they are defense compounds too, and they have gone. And this beautiful photograph, which looks like a Dutch still life from the golden period, it's not a painting at all, it's a photograph, and this is what apples and pears used to look like. They were small, they were fibrous, they were not as sweet as they are today, and they contained higher levels of polyphenol. This is what we eat today because the farmers make money depending on the weight of their crop. And the consumer demands sweetness. But a plant only has so much energy to it on any given day from the sunlight. If its energy is being directed to growth and to sugar production, it has less energy available to produce the phytoalexins, such as the polyphenols that we need. That's what's gone wrong. Another example that I often talk about is the grape or the raisin. I'm sure that you're all too young to have children, but if you have younger brothers and sisters, maybe your parents like to give them raisins as a treat instead of sweets because they think that raisins are healthier. Raisins have so much sugar in them now that you might as well give your children confectionery. It's all the same thing. Today's raisin is nothing like the raisin or grape that it used to be. Grapes come from the Fertile Crescent between the Tigris and the Euphrates in the Middle East. And if you go there, you can see the grapes and the raisins that are still produced today, the original ones. They're small, they're fibrous, they are not very sweet. They contain high levels of polyphenols. They've been changed completely. So much so that fruit today has become 
hazardous for the diabetic. Fruit is no longer healthy. Fruits and vegetables are not what they used to be. So let's take a look at how people actually were in the blue zone. Now the 1850 to 1899 period is known as the mid-Victorian period in England. And one of the interesting aspects of this period in time was not only was it a golden era of health, they were far healthier than you were and far smarter too. But this was also an age that documented itself, not with selfies, which I think is a completely degenerate activity. No, but they did take photographs and they recorded everything. So we know how long they lived, we know what they died of, we know what they ate, we know how they worked. We know a lot about them. And this was the beginning of photography, so we can tell how they looked. So this is a class in a small school, in a small town in the north of England, this small damp island off the west coast of Europe that at that time controlled a third of the world. Look at those people, look at their shape. First of all, let me tell you that they lived as long as we do today. In fact, Victorian men lived longer than men do today. They had three years more life expectancy. They probably don't teach you that at medical school. They teach you that things keep on getting better and better. No, that's not true. But look at their shape. Look at these two ladies, this one and this one. Look at their body shape, they're size zero. How many calories a day do you think those ladies were eating? Now, we know, we have recorded exactly what they ate. So, tell me what you think. How many calories were those ladies eating every day? Give me a number. How much? 2,000. It's, yeah, it's more like 4,000. And the men were eating between six and 7,000 calories a day. They were like Olympic athletes. Everything they did was done by hand, everything. They're eating huge amounts of food and none of it is processed. They're eating huge amounts of phytonutrients and the right types of fatty acids. And the reason why they're so slim is because they're burning all of those calories. And they were extremely healthy. So what went wrong? Well, technology. Technology it changed every aspect of the way in which we live. It changed our entire culture. It changed the way we build our cities. It changed everything. So let me ask you, how many of you walked to the university today? A few, that's not bad. How many cycled? <laughs> that's really good. You know, if I ask that question in America, nobody puts their hand up. They're so dependent on the automobile. <clears throat> They're more dependent than you could possibly imagine. Uh, this was a photograph taken in Flint, Michigan. And Michigan, uh, of course, and Detroit, this is the home of the big four. This is where America builds its cars. And increasingly, they, as the economy keeps on going down, they live in them and die in them too. This is not the right way to walk your dog. Healthy for the dog, but not for the driver. In fact, Americans have become astonishingly physically inactive. They are uh, sitting down for eight hours a day, either behind the wheel or behind the desk. They're actually walking far less than 2,000 steps a day. And that's one of the reasons why overweight and obesity is such a problem in North America. Interestingly, there is one group that doesn't use the internal combustion engine, that is the Amish. They walk on average uh, eight times as far as the, uh, as the, as the non-Amish. And in fact, in that group, obesity is still present in women, but far, far lower rate. It is non-existent in Amish men. And I can vouch for that. I've been to the Amish communities. I've talked to them. I've spent time with them and they are far, far healthier. Now that was a ridiculous example of how you should not be physically inactive. This is a more Subtle example, it's a remote control. Even that has changed. And my parents, <clears throat> uh, my, my family have been scientists for many generations, but my parents bought the first television in 
uh, in the town that I grew up in. And the televisions in those days were very small, black and white. There was only two channels, I think, um, but there were no remotes. So if you wanted to change the channel on your television, you actually had to stand up. You had to get up from your chair. You then had to walk all the way across the room to the television. You actually had to change the channels by hand. But that's not all. When you've done that, you had to walk all the way back to your chair again. And my point is this, in all kinds of ways, in many ways, some very large and some very small, we have become progressively less physically active. We are the least physically active generation that has ever existed. Because we are lulled, we are seduced into becoming less active. There are evolutionary reasons for this, which I don't think we've got time to go into. But our calorific expenditure, our level of physical activity has fallen by approximately a third in the last generation. And it has fallen by between half and two thirds since over the last century. And what has happened is our appetites have shrunk as well. We're eating far less than we used to. And if you don't believe me, do a little bit of history. Read the novels of the 19th century. Read for yourselves the descriptions of the meals that our grandparents and great-grandparents used to eat. They used to eat enormous amounts of food. If you try living like a big Victorian, you'll find that you'll do the same thing as well. I've tried it, it's hard work. And within a very short period of time, your appetite increases three times. But you don't get fat, you stay slim because you're working so hard. And this is a paradox. How is it that we're eating so little and yet we have such a problem with overweight and obesity? And it's because at these very low levels of physical activity, the multiple mechanisms that link your calorie requirements to your appetite, and there are at least four and maybe half a dozen, they start to break down. They simply don't function at that level of calorific throughput. So many of us eat a little more than we need to. And that is encouraged by the food industry who want to sell us more and surround us with advertisements telling us to consume this and consume that. And it's also encouraged by convenience. Because now if you're hungry, all you have to do is go to the deep freeze in the microwave and bing, five minutes later you have food. Lots of calories, not much nutrition. A hundred years ago, it wasn't like that. In the Victorian period, the best-selling cookbook was called Mrs. Beaton's Cookbook, and they have a recipe for stewed hair. You know, the hair is like a rabbit book with, you know? And the first line of the recipe, the first line of the recipe is, says, first catch your hair. So if you wanted to eat, you had to plan ahead. Now it's all instant gratification. We're not designed to live in an environment of food overabundance, of food, total food security. It's not good for us. So many of us eat a little bit more than we need to, perhaps 200 calories a day more than we need on average. And 200 calories a day is really nothing. A biscuit. But that's 1,400 calories a day a week, too much. 5,000 calories a month, too much. 60,000 calories a year, too much. So even although we're eating very little, more and more of us are becoming heavy. And then the foods that we are eating, many of them have very low or zero nutrient content. And what this graph shows you is our increase in sugar intake. Calories and no nutritional value whatsoever. So we're eating very little and many of the foods that we are eating have a nutrient content or density that is far lower than humans have ever eaten before. You know, the companies that manufacture food do not make life easier for us. And that is why you have this paradox. We're eating very little, we're getting heavier. And the people who are heaviest of all 
are eating foods with a high calorific density, low nutrient density, which is why the higher your BMI, the lower your nutritional profile is likely to be. Very paradoxical. And we can drill down into this and we can look at it in more detail. This is a survey we conduct in Britain once every four years, looking at depletion measured in yellow, deficiency measured in red, of various vitamins and minerals. And see here, this is iron. Obviously, girls are more likely to be deficient than boys. But you can see there's a high percentage of people who are depleted in iron. This is vitamin A, and this is zinc. And the picture just goes on. Most people are depleted in most micronutrients. In fact, we now have a serious problem of malnutrition. Now, this is not the classical malnutrition that I was taught at medical school. This is not type A malnutrition, which is characterized by a lack of calories and very often a complete absence or near absence of one of the water soluble nutrients, vitamins which we don't store very well. So if you stop eating it, you move into a deficiency state fairly quickly and you see a well-defined constellation of symptoms, which is how we came to recognize scorbutism or beriberi or pellagra. And that is your typical type A case of malnutrition. But you don't see that. You don't suffer from that. What you have is type B malnutrition, where you have enough or maybe too many calories, but you are low, not deficient necessarily, but low in many vitamins, many minerals, most phytonutrients, most polyphenols, carotenoids and xanthophils, most fiber types, the essential fatty acids, particularly the threes, cyanogens, methyl group donors, you're low in all of them. And that's what that looks like. In fact, it looks like you. So it's not just me saying this. These are the experts on both sides of the Atlantic. They say disnutrition is now almost universal. Low physical activity, low food intake, low nutrient density equals disnutrition. And this culminated in a statement by the United Nations in 2006. We need a new definition of malnutrition. Not quantity, but quality of the food is the problem. Disnutrition is pandemic in the world today. In fact, 2015, the US Department of Health Metrics and Evaluation published in The Lancet a paper which says, poor diet is the biggest cause of early death globally. And you can't fix that with pharmaceutical. You can only fix it by improving people's nutritional status. So this is a response to your question. I thought I told you I'd come around. How is it we could all be so malnourished when we have access to a wider range of foods than ever before? You go to the supermarket and there's a never ending range, which keeps on changing just to keep you interested and happy, of processed and ultra processed foods. Well, that diversity is very misleading for two reasons. Firstly, when you look at the ingredients in all of these processed foods, you find that actually almost all of them have a huge overlap. They all have corn and soy and sugar in them and salt, flavoring compounds, stabilizers, emulsifiers, preservatives, not much nutrition. But another reason why this diversity is misleading is that behind all those brands and sub-brands, there's actually only a very small number of companies that now control global food retail sector. And here are some of them. PepsiCo, Nestle, Coca-Cola, Unilever, Mars, Mondelez, Kellogg's, and so on. These dominate the world, the food universe today. And this is a food universe which is guaranteed to make you sick. It is guaranteed to cause chronic inflammation the release of the matrix metalloproteases, gradual tissue destruction, and chronic degenerative disease. How does it do it? It does it almost as if it had been planned to do it. I don't wish to sound too paranoid, 
We don't have to start talking about conspiracy theories. Maybe we would be happier speaking about collusion, a convergence of interests. Because this food universe, first of all, it has an extremely high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, which means that the upper chamber of the inflammasome is running hot. It has a very, very low level of polyphenols. Why? Where do polyphenols, where do you find them in a typical fruit or vegetable? Take an apple. The polyphenols are in the skin of the apple because they're there to protect the fruit and they're at the core to protect the DNA of the next generation. What does McDonald's do when it takes an apple and makes it into an apple pie? It takes off the skin, throws away the core. All you have left is water, cellulose, sugar, and a little trace of vitamin C, which by the time that apple pie has been through the McDonald's supply chain has disappeared anyway. So the polyphenol content has fallen almost to zero. Pathological lack of 1,3,1,6 beta-glucans. 1,3,1,6 beta-glucans are simple carbohydrate molecules that we derive, these are not 1,3,1,4, those you get from oats. 1,3,1,6 we derive from the cell walls of yeast. They're very, very important because they activate the CR3 receptor. If they're not activated, those immune cells are incapacitated. There are evolutionary reasons for this. All higher life forms are constantly under attack by molds and yeasts, which is why all life forms from insects to fish to mammals to humans have a CR3 receptor designed to identify and respond to the 1,3,1,6 beta-glucans in yeast. Not only do they do that, our immune systems have become dependent on these molecules to act properly. It is only when these compounds are present in the diet and in our bodies that immune cells, particularly innate immune cells, macrophages, neutrophils, tumoricidal granulocytes, Langerhans cells, Kupfer cells, it is only when this receptor is activated that they can migrate to the site of an infection effectively, i.e. respond to a chemocline, and when they arrive at the site of the infection, phagocytose the offending microorganism and kill it. If those compounds are not in the food chain and not in your body, your innate immune system cannot function properly. You become more at risk of chronic grumbling infections, which cause chronic inflammation. We used to eat large amounts of these compounds. They were present in fermented alcoholic drinks, wines and beers. They were present in fermented foods such as bread. And they were present as trace contaminants in every mouthful of food we ate. Since 1950, the brewing industry has bought in ultra-filtration techniques, which means that beers and wines are now clear, have a longer shelf life, but they contain no more beta-glucan. Bread production has changed. Bread contains less of these compounds and we eat far less bread than we used to. And the contamination of the food chain that was so important prior to 1950 has been terminated by the development of the synthetic fungicides, which have turned the countryside into a war zone. Our intakes of these molecules have fallen by approximately 95%, which means not only do you have more vulnerability to infection and more risk of chronic subclinical infections causing chronic inflammation, you also are no longer capable of instructing your naive T helper cells, which means that you have an abnormal Th1 to Th2 ratio, which means you are far more likely to have an allergy. So these compounds have gone. You have chronic inflammation. A pathological excess of ages and ails, advanced glycosidation end products, advanced lipoxidation end products. Processed foods contain large amounts of these because they are produced when foods are cooked at high temperatures. And processed foods contain them at very high levels because these companies know 
that to make large amounts of foods profitably, you must make them quickly, which means you have to cook them at high temperatures, higher than the temperatures you usually use at home. So most processed foods contain high amounts of these compounds, and through the age rage interaction, they trigger chronic inflammation. It's like throwing matches onto gasoline. You already have chronic inflammation, this makes it worse. And now for the coup de grace. This processed food universe also fails to provide you with prebiotic fibers. Now what happens if you don't eat prebiotics? If you don't eat prebiotic fibers, your microbiome switches to predominantly gram-negative Gram-negative microbes are called gram-negative, as I'm sure you know, because they do not take gram stain. And the reason why they do not take gram stain is that their cell walls are constructed of lipopolysaccharides. So if your microbiome is largely gram-negative, your gut is full of lipopolysaccharide, and this is a highly pro-inflammatory compound. So now, your large bowel is also a source of chronic inflammation. So this diet, could not be better designed to cause chronic inflammation. This is a toxic diet. It is not toxic in the acute sense. You can go home tonight, eat a bowl of cereal, or a pizza, or a chocolate bar, you'll still come back to university tomorrow morning. It's not going to kill you overnight. But if your diet is based around these types of foods for long periods of time, it will give you chronic inflammation. It will give you chronic degenerative disease, and it will kill you. It is undoubtedly toxic. I feel another question coming on. <laughs> Designed, you're, you're, you're a little paranoid, my friend. Okay, okay, well let me answer the, those two questions uh, in sequence. Do I think this is deliberate? It looks as if it is. I'm not convinced that it is deliberate. I think that the industry has had reasons for doing things in the way that they have. There are historical accidents and precedents which have led us to this stage. But let me indulge your paranoia for a moment. <laughs> There's only a small number of companies involved. Behind those food companies, an even smaller number of financial institutions behind those financial institutions, an even smaller number of families. There's eight families who control a disproportionate share of the industrial economy and who have said very clearly over the last half century that they're interested in depopulation scenarios. We're becoming more stupid. We're becoming less fertile. Life expectancy is shortening and nothing that the medical profession is doing today has even touched those problems. Conspiracy? Who knows? Maybe. Maybe not. What do you do about this? Well, you don't go to your doctor. <laughs> I suggest you go to your political representatives and ask them when there are so many problems, healthcare problems that are burdening Hungary, when the evidence is so clear that the Hungarian population is being chronically poisoned by the foods that are making it available to them, why don't you do something about it? You know, if I were to ask that question in America or Britain, I would know what the answer was going to be. They're not interested because our politicians are bought, they are owned, they are rented by the lobbyists who now control most democracies, which are no longer democracies, but they are in fact technically fascist organizations. I'm using Mussolini's definition of the merger between state and corporate power. American politics is owned by the lobbying groups, largely by the military industrial complex, and the same is true of most European nations. Hungary is a light in the dark. I think you have a government which is not working in quite that way. but this is a lecture about nutrition, not politics. <laughs> in medicine, everything is political. Our attitudes to food are very personal, they're very emotional. The business 
of medicine, however, is very political. Do you know why medicine is so centered on pharmaceutical pharmacology? A hundred years ago, most of medicine was natural medicine. It was based on food, as it has been for the last 2,000 years. And what happened is that John Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, who was one of the oil barons of the early 20th century, he and his colleagues, they wanted to sell oil, more oil. And so they said to the major medical universities of the time, stop practicing natural medicine, start selling drugs. Why? Because the drugs at that time were made from oil. Oil was the stock. That's all it was. So the natural mouth, mental medical practitioners were run out of business. The medical schools were given all the money in the world, providing they only taught medicine based on synthetic drugs. They were bribed. And that is why the curriculum you learn today is still based on pharmaceutical products, on synthetic xenochemistry, which is the wrong foundation for healthcare. Let's go back to our mid-Victorians. That's how they looked then, and this is how they look today in that same town. Can you see the difference? The difference is this. Everything that we used to do by hand or by foot has been taken over. And do you know what? The same lifestyle which is making us fat, which is making us sick, is doing the same to the animals that share our life spaces. They too are becoming overweight, obese, developing diabetes, cancer, heart disease and dementia. The veterinarians see exactly the same problems in animals as doctors see in their human animals. This lifestyle, this food universe is killing all of us. So chronic inflammation is the driver. We know that the Mediterranean diet produces chronic inflammation. It's very protective for many diseases. And in the nurses study, which is a very well-known medical study, the Mediterranean diet reduced the risk of chronic disease and disability very, very significantly. It increased the odds of surviving past the age of 70 by 40%. In the Whitehall 2 cohort study, Again, a long-term study, good numbers. Healthy aging was almost exclusively identified in that smaller group who did not eat the modern Western processed diet. This is the Hale Project. But there's also EPIC and other studies, and they all show the same thing, that if you have a Mediterranean diet, have a moderate level of physical activity, don't smoke, then death from all causes is reduced by two-thirds, and that is more than any drug can do. That is more than all the drugs can do. But we can do more. We can go back to the blue zones, such as the mid-Victorian era. They were a blue-collar society, and they worked very hard. They worked 10 hours a day between five and a half and six days a week. Most of that work was physical. They walked to work. No public transport, no cars, no trains, no buses. Their leisure activity was also mostly physical. And if you add all that up, that's 60 to 75 hours of physical activity a week. They were like Olympic athletes in training. And what did they eat? Huge amounts of food because they were so active. Very little salt, almost no tobacco because industrial cigarette production doesn't arrive until the end of the 19th century. They drank beer but that beer had an alcohol content of only 1 to 1.5%. 1 they hardly had any high octane alcohol at all because the method of chronic continuous distillation, which produces cheap vodka and gin and whiskey today, or palinka, that industrial model didn't arrive until the end of the century either. Lots of omega-3s, not many omega-6s, 10 portions of fruit and vegetables a day on average. That is a super Mediterranean diet. So what did that do to their health? Well, mid-Victorian women had an average life expectancy of 73. 
Now it's about 76 in the same socioeconomic group. You have to do very careful comparisons if you want to look at different countries or different times. Why are women living longer? Better family planning. Better obstetrics. That's all. Men have actually lost three years. We have lost ground. We are losing the war. And it's actually, we've lost more than that. We've lost health expectancy. Now, we can expect to spend the last 10% of our lives in a condition of progressive physical incapacity. We die slowly and expensively. That's not how they die in the blue zones. That's not how they died in the Victorian era. There, they kept their physical, mental, and sexual capacity until right before the end, and they died suddenly and cheaply. That was why, where we spend 10% of GDP on healthcare, they spent less than a half of a percent. They didn't need to. They didn't need all the diagnostics, all the pharmaceuticals, all the surgery that we do. They were just so healthy, they didn't need any of that because they were so well nourished. Now we start coming to cancer. They had 90% less cancer or heart disease than we do today. 90% less in a population that lived as long. Only 10%. So here, typically, this is the English data today, heart and cancer accounts for about two-thirds in the period 1880, about six or seven percent. So that's 10% of what we see today. And that figure of 10% is very interesting because if you ask an oncologist or a cardiologist how many of your patients are here because they have strong genetic risk factors, they say about 10%. And the lesson that I draw from this is that in the Victorian era, it is only the people with genetic risk factors who become ill. Everybody else is protected because their diet is so anti-inflammatory. Now, when it comes to cancer, we operate really according to the Ames hypothesis. The exponential accumulation of genetic damage means that the risk of cancer increases exponentially with age. We think of that as normal. We think it's normal to have more cancer and more degenerative disease as we get older. Not true in the Victorian era. In the Victorian era, the peak age for cancer is in the 30s and 40s. Instead of going up like this, it goes like this, age of 30 and 40, and then it disappears. It's only the people with genetic risk factors who present with cancer, people who survive, don't have those risk factors and they are protected right up until the ends of their lives. They die typically of fulminating infection, not chronic degenerative disease. In other words, the Ames hypothesis of accumulation of DNA insults leading to an exponential increase in cancer risk is an artifact. That's what we see today, but that is not what we saw in the 19th century. Take, for example, breast cancer. Breast cancer was studied at that time by the very famous physician William Paget. William Paget, who gives us Paget's disease of bone. He was the president of my former club, the Royal Society of Medicine. But his speciality was breast cancer. Now, he didn't have the diagnostics that we do. He couldn't do screens or scans. He could only diagnose breast cancer by sight or by touch which means he was only picking up breast cancer at stages three and four. And what treatment does he have? Well, very little, he only has surgery, that's all. We tried to measure how long his patient survived for. And we couldn't do it, because most of them lived longer than he did. He, did, he died of alcohol poisoning. But most of his patients were still alive, even with genetic risk factors even with the surgery of that time, which was, we would consider barbaric. Because they were eating a diet that was so protective. Looked at from this perspective, you almost have to have sympathy for cancer. Because it's really not easy to get cancer at all. You have to have a lot of genetic hits to trigger the runaway growth that makes a cancer cell dangerous. Each cell accumulates about 100 hits a day, and I'm in agreement with Bruce Ames there. We have a repair system that's actually very robust, but cancer cells are continually appearing. 
But the truth is that most of those cancer cells or colonies die very early before they become clinically significant because of oxidative stress, because of immune recognition, because of other dietary factors which kill cancer cells. In other words, clinical cancer can only occur after a cancer cell has succeeded in overcoming many layers of defense. Now it just so happens in the 19th century, all of those many layers of defense were functional. In today's population, they are all dysfunctional because of that diet that I showed you a little moment ago. So, so looked at from another way. The cancer cell has a huge problem ahead of it if it is going to become successful. It has got to achieve a greater rate of cell division or reduce cell death. It's got to be able to displace normal tissue. In order to do that, cancer cells mostly have membrane disorganization problems. They have to be able to resist oxidative stress. They have to escape the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. They have to be able to override cell contact inhibition, which is upregulated by carotenoids. They have to overcome the presence of redifferentiating compounds, which are carotenoids, xanthophils, and polyphenols, more phytonutrients. They have to avoid apoptotic induction, what induces apoptosis or mid-cell cycle arrest. It is those same phytonutrients, the carotenoids, the polyphenols, the xanthophils, which have all gone from our diet. And the cancer, if it's going to become significant, also has to overcome those compounds which inhibit the proteases and the matrix metalloproteases, which are involved in chronic inflammation. What compounds inhibit those? Well, the proteases are inhibited by protease inhibitors, such as the burke bowman protein, or lectin, which you find in plant foods. The matrix metalloproteases are both inhibited in the classical sense and the genes that express them are downregulated by the polyphenols. They've all gone from our diet. So cancer should be a rare condition. And in fact, in the Victorian age, it is very, very rare. Because for a start, they don't really have obesity. So it doesn't occur. Which means that their adipose tissue is not producing pro-inflammatory adipocytokines. And the adipose tissue they do have is stabilized by high concentrations of phytonutrients. Their omega-6 to 3 ratio is about 2 to 1. So the upper chamber of the inflammasome has been stabilized. They're eating huge amounts of polyphenols and other phytonutrients, which do two things. Firstly, they switch off the lower compartment of the inflammasome, and they also force cancer cells to redifferentiate to re-express C43, in other words, to re-experience cell contact inhibition. And they tell cancer cells to commit suicide, to arrest at mid-cell cycle, to redifferentiate. Those compounds were there in the Victorian diet. Large amounts of beta-glucans, which means their innate immune systems are working properly. Very little tobacco and spirits, which we know are carcinogens, and when consumed together, are super-additive carcinogens. They are not eating cooked meat carcinogens, which we eat when we fry or roast or barbecue. The Victorians have fuel poverty. When they cook meat, it is almost always by stewing in water, which never gets above 100 degrees. And you know what? They also, in, when they cook their meat, almost always add onions. And the sulfur compounds in onions prevent the formation of FIP and the other cooked meat carcinogens. So they're not consuming those, whereas we consume them in very large amounts. Phase two inducers, if they do ingest carcinogens, they are eating large amounts of glucosinolates and polyphenols, which upregulate phase two excretory enzymes. So those carcinogens are being removed from the body. They're being detoxified and removed. And finally, they don't have type two diabetes. They don't have hyperglycemia. They don't have hyperinsulinemia, and they're not full of insulin-like growth factors. You know what? This slide is not complete. It doesn't show you that the Victorians are protected in another way, as well as all of these ways. Because they're so physically active, that switches on AMP kinase, and that downregulates mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. So there is no local growth promotion of cancer. So the cancer cell, which is appearing every day in the Victorian, has nowhere to go. It's being attacked on all sides. Cancer 
hardly occurs at all, except in those people who have a strong genetic risk factor. In everyone else of every age, the cancers have nowhere to go. They're still forming in their bodies, but they're being inhibited, they're being killed. So the Victorians do not get more cancer as they get older. What happens to us in comparison? Overweight and obesity is very common, which means that our adipose tissue is excessive, it is infiltrated by macrophages, which are causing chronic inflammation, leading to the result of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which drive chronic inflammation elsewhere in the body, therefore making it easier for a cancer to grow and to spread. The beta-glucans have gone, our innate immune systems have gone, tumorocidal granulocytes are ineffective. If a cancer has been recognized by the adaptive immune system without the beta-glucans, the normal cancer cell killing mechanisms involving either neutrophils in the innate immune system or other types of cells in the adaptive immune system aren't working. So that line of defense is down as well. We drink large amounts of spirits. We smoke far more than they do. We're exposed to far more carcinogens in our food as well because we cook our meat and many of our foods differently. And our intake of phase two inducers is reduced by about 80 to 90%. So when we do ingest these carcinogens in the foods we eat, we do not excrete them. We keep them in the body. And we have serious problems with hyperinsulinemia and excessive insulin-like growth factors. And because we are so inactive, our AMPK is down, therefore mTOR is up. Therefore, if you do have a cancer, it is more likely to be promoted. Now can you see why cancer is so rare in the 19th century and so very common today? It's complicated. It's not just one single issue. There are many, many different factors which are all playing a role. But it's very easy to escape from this prison. At the moment, we're being caught between two millstones, a food industry, which is making us sick, and a medical industry, which makes us even sicker. All you have to do is to disintermediate, just step outside the two walls of this prison. Stop eating processed food. Start eating basic foods. Or if you can't do that, if you don't have enough time, then at least change your ratio of sixes to threes and start eating more polyphenols. Switch off chronic inflammation, which not only protects against cancer, it also protects against all of the rest of degenerative disease as far as we can see. The Victorians had it all right. We have it all wrong. That is why all of you have friends or relatives who have or have had cancer. That's why Hungary is number one in the Cancer International League tables. That's why we need so much radiotherapy, oncotherapy, which I call, which I regard as barbaric, uncivilized medicine. This has huge implications for the cost of healthcare. In the past, we have been very familiar with the idea that chronic degenerative disease is going to affect about 80 to 90 percent of us and kill large numbers of us. We know that the, the Mediterranean diet cuts that by approximately half, but the question was, what happens if you improve the Mediterranean diet? Does it get better? Have we reached a plateau? Does it get worse? Well, what we now know is that the Mid-Victorian diet is even more protective than the Mediterranean diet because it contains even higher levels of these extremely important and highly protective phytonutrients. And now, what we're starting to ask is the question is, can we go even further? Can we get even better than 90% protection? And there are avenues of investigation that we're looking into now, which suggest that yes, maybe we can. What does this mean in terms of the types of facts that a politician could understand? Well, if you could capture 60% of the market, if you could improve the diet and say 60% of the population by our calculations, you'd reduce non-communicable disease by at least two-thirds and we're being very conservative we think it might be more that would lead to a reduction in healthcare spending of about 75 percent which means six percent of gross economic product in most european countries and almost 14 percent in the united states so what do you do you can take fish oil but we know that fish oil doesn't work you know that don't you 25 prospective randomized clinical trials show that fish oil doesn't work 
eating oily fish is healthy, but fish oil capsules are not. Why not? Because fish oil is not oily fish. There are many things in an oily fish which are not present in fish oil. If you look at unrefined fish oil or oil from a whale or a seal or oil from a person who eats those foods, it has this strange color. It's a brown color. We were very curious. We wanted to know what that was and we identified it as a compound that you find in seaweed. Called, it's a polyphenol, a lipid soluble polyphenol called a fluorotannin. Very important compound. Fish don't make omega-3s. They get it from the seaweed. Just as land plants make omega-6s, marine cold water species make omega-3s. And the same seaweeds that make the omega-3s make the fluorotannins. In fact, you never find omega-3s without fluorotannins. So the omega-3s travel from the seaweed to the plankton, the krill, the fish, the marine mammals, and then to the inuit, the apex predator. But how can the omega-3s travel so far? If you take a fish oil capsule and open it, put it on your hand, within a minute you can smell that omega-3 is breaking down, it is becoming rancid. So how could the omega-3s travel through six trophic layers of a marine ecosystem over a period of many, many months and still arrive intact? in the apex predator because nature designed the polyphenols to protect the omega-3s. The polyphenols, these polyphenols are chaperone compounds. They transport the omega-3s through the entire system, keeping them sweet, and they travel with them until they get into the apex predator. These polyphenols are extremely effective at protecting omega-3s against oxidative stress. In this model, this is a test we did with the Norwegian government Oil with astaxanthin or omega-3 oxidizes very quickly, but if you use the right polyphenols from seaweed or olives, the oil remains sweet until the technicians go home. These polyphenols are so effective at preventing the omega-3s from being oxidized that they're now being used by the fishery industry to preserve fish. This was all published in a paper that I co-wrote with my friend and colleague, Sabol Shladi in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine a few years ago. And this paper became one of the top 5% most downloaded papers in the whole of science, not just in medical science, but in the whole of science for a brief while. It was nice being famous, even in a very low key way. And the fish oil industry absolutely hated it. And I went to meetings where they would shout at me, they'd scream at me in these conferences saying, you're destroying our industry, you're destroying confidence in fish oil. Well, fish oil is a fraud. Omega-3s are a fraud. They only work if you combine them with the polyphenols. You see, in the same way that the polyphenols act as chaperones in the marine food chain, they do the same thing in your body. When you take the omega-3s, if they're on their own, by the time they reach the stomach, or the small intestine, they've started to break down already. If you take them with the polyphenols, they keep the omega-3 safe on its dangerous journey through the stomach, the small intestine, the portal circulation, the liver, the systemic circulation, all the way to the peripheral tissues, which takes up to 24 hours. The polyphenols travel with the omega-3s through the system in the same way that they travel through the marine food chain. So this is the way, a very simple way, in which you can reduce your risk of cancer. There's much more than you can do, but this is where you should start. And this will also protect you against degenerative disease at a frequency which, according to the Victorian data, may be as high as 90%. Nothing to do with medicine, not pharmaceutical medicine, everything to do with nutrition. This is how you escape the prison. It's very easy to do, very cheap. And I am looking for a future where none of you will be necessary. And I won't be necessary. The medical profession will be largely redundant. We can all retrain and become artists or musicians or writers. No, I'm kidding. There'll always be a need for doctors. And I don't want you to think that I'm against pharmaceutical pharmacology either. It has a place. It has a place, but just not the center of medicine. The models that we use now, when we see people with serious degenerative conditions, of course we use pharmaceutical products to treat their symptoms. But at the same time, 
We use nutritional programs to reduce the burden of chronic inflammation. And as that becomes less, the requirement for pharmaceuticals becomes less as well. These people are not going to be dependent on pharmaceuticals for the rest of their lives. We can use lower doses for less period of time and in that way reduce the risk of adverse effects. The drugs themselves become safer and more practical to use. So I'm not saying it's a question of natural pharmacology versus synthetic. We use them together in truly integrative medicine. I mean, if you look at the medical textbooks of, let's say, 1900, you will see 30, 40, 50 pages on type 1 diabetes. But for type 2 diabetes, maybe only four or five pages. It was not significant. And yet today it's overwhelming us. It's so clearly a lifestyle disease. But just calling it a lifestyle disease or a disease of civilization is not enough. We have to be analytical. We have to try to understand what the factors are in the lifestyle that predispose to that illness. And then we can start to remedy it. And I think that we are at a point now where we understand the connection between your lifestyle, your diet, and your risk of disease. We actually understand what the machinery is. And the major obstacles, the major hurdles between where we are now and better health for you as individuals and for, for the nation. These obstacles are no longer scientific. I think that they're political, they're regulatory, and they're economic. So this is, this is where we are. We are facing a political problem, not a medical one anymore. I do apologize for speaking too long. Thank you.